uh, hello everyone. I'm Saurabh. Um, I work as a senior front-end engineer at Razorpay. Um, I also I'm also working on this um, tiny side project called um, Rebel. Um, but we're not going to talk about Rebel today. Um, if um, you can also reach out to me on Saurabh Dawri with an extra e on Twitter. So yeah, let's 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 build a front-end framework. Uh, so yeah, we're we'll basically going to do that. We're going to build a front-end framework. Uh, maybe not. Literally, but uh, we'll just idealize um, and ideate a few things about what features we would like in a front end framework. Um, so let's say um, we were about to build a front end framework, or let's say you're building anything, um, you first need a problem statement. So, what would be a problem statement for a front end framework? Um, in my opinion, it would be something like this to make it easy for you to build a better user experience. Um, that's what front-end frameworks do. They make it um, easy for you to build complicated user experiences, which otherwise would have been very difficult in a vanilla um, setup. So um, I'll, I'll talk about this statement. We'll, we'll break it down. Um, let's talk about, um, so to make it easy for you to build a better user experience, let's talk about the better user experience part first. What do we mean by a better user experience? Um, in my opinion, it will be uh, first thing will be how smooth the site feels. It's a very vague term, but um, generally, when you visit mobile apps or um, any application and um, you you go through navigation, so you click buttons and it interacts, and it just overall uh, adds up. It just overall improves your user experience. So um, my first point would be how smooth the site feels. Again, we'll talk about this in details. Um, Next point would be how fast it shows useful information. If I'm um, clicking a button and then I have to wait a really long time for um, some useful information to show up, then it's a bad user experience for me. So how fast my, maybe my initial page goes or how fast my subsequent navigations go. This is also something that adds up to better user experience. Uh, another thing is accessibility and internationalization. Um, if um, the site is not accessible to uh, some people, or um, maybe uh, so, uh, let's say if someone has, a, if someone wants to um, understand an image and it doesn't have art tag, or um, just things like that uh, that are related to accessibility, um, that also comes as a part of user experience. Um, internationalization again, if you're reading a documentation site and it is not in a language that you understand, then it's you're not really going to understand anything from the documentation site. So uh, depending on use uh, case by case cases, internationalization is again something that adds up to better user experience. Uh, then there are some features, some product features like a search bar. Let's say you're in a documentation site and there's a search bar on top where you can just go and search what you need and then it takes you to that page. That's a better user experience. That's a product feature that adds a better user experience. Or um, showing appropriate errors. If um, something goes wrong, then your, the website telling you that this is where it went wrong and this is what you can do to uh, fix it, things like that. Um, we'll talk, like I said, the talk is about front-end frameworks. We're going to talk about in context of front-end frameworks. Uh, there are a few things like uh, product features, for example, search or um, showing appropriate errors. These things, uh, they lie on consumer ends, where um, it depends on how the person using the front-end framework is adding it. Uh, also, things like uh, accessibility or internationalization. Accessibility, uh, in particular, um, can be part of front-end framework in terms of routing. For example, if I'm changing the routes, then I have to announce um, it to users that the route is changed. Uh, but again, the eventual uh, final accessibility of application lies on um, the consumer end. So what we're going to um, talk about in details today is these two things how fast it shows useful information and how smooth the site feels. Um, basically around performance and, um, but not just uh, loading performance, but just overall interaction interaction performance. Now, what do we mean by how fast site shows useful information? So we have, um, we have uh, web vitals, which gives us things like first contentful paint or largest contentful paint and that gives you score. But uh, I really want to talk more in terms of user experience rather than in terms of numbers today. So um, in, in this context, I'm not really talking about LCP or FCP here, but um, just how what is useful for your site. For example, this is razorpay.com. Uh, this is how it looks on desktop and mobile. If you ask me what is, what is the most useful information on this page, I would say all of it. Um, if I just load this particular part, 
uh, this text and this image, but delay loading the nav bar, that's still a bad user experience. If I just load nav bar and don't load this part, that's again still a bad user experience because um, all of this um, collectively um, conveys the information that the site is going to give. For example, the nav bar gives, um, tells you that there's a payments view, then there's a banking products, there's resources, partners, and then you can just check out pricing or there's a login sign up CTAs. Then again, there's a text that informs you uh, what the site is about, what the recipe is about, um, and there's an informative image. So all of it is in uh, useful information. Um, now let's talk about this in terms of tech. What do we mean by showing useful information in terms of tech? It means how fast you get the HTML and CSS. If you see um, both of these examples, um, it's just HTML, CSS. We're not talking about JavaScript here. We're not talking about interaction yet. We're just talking about the showing the information and that has to be HTML and CSS because that's what renders on your screen. So we want to get info, uh, we want to get the HTML and CSS as quick as possible. Which, uh, which takes us to our first topic, rendering patterns. Uh, I'm just going to uh, pause here for a second because I worked really hard on this pun. So yeah, I hope you get it. Um, so first, uh, we'll go into client-side rendering. Um, this is usually the default type of rendering that you get when you use front-end frameworks. Um, so this is basically what you get when you do create React app. Um, well, now the problems here is, uh, so at first we get the index.html, which is going to be empty and not going to have any content, which will have a link to JavaScript. So that will load the JavaScript. Um, after downloading JavaScript, it will execute the JavaScript and basically this JavaScript will inject the inject your HTML into your uh, actual HTML. And that, that eventually shows the page. Um, this is this is again a simplified version. I'm not uh, I didn't add CSS here. I just this is just under assumption that CSS is critical CSS and images load pretty fast. Just um, to simplify things for a uh, client side rendering. But yeah, this is essentially the problem that um, if I, let's say if this JavaScript size is bigger, then it just takes more and more time to show the first useful information. This becomes even bigger problem if you have code splitting and multiple routes. For example, if I have multiple routes on my page on client side and I code split the home page, that means my first page doesn't, it, it, it isn't going to know what page, what chunk to load, and that it will only get to know after the first main.js is loaded. So you just end up with this waterfall and um, the first useful information just keeps on getting to you. We have some solutions to it. Um, one is server-side rendering. Server-side rendering essentially means um, just rendering that HTML, building that HTML on the server and sending that HTML in the first request itself. So when we get the first index of HTML hit, it has all the information um, about the HTML. Basically, it will have all the information about this power, your finance, your business titles, or it will have the navbar uh, information as well. If you notice here, um, in client-side rendering, the site was get uh, showing useful information after the first, uh, after the last JavaScript load. But uh, in server-side rendering, it just start, it can start showing useful information just after the first index of HTML. So even if my JavaScript uh, grows large, or um, if um, if I add multiple JavaScript files, that still doesn't delay my first uh, initial useful information. Um, this is this is great, uh, but this can be optimized. So what we have here is, so uh, what we have to solve is we have we can make this index of HTML load faster. Let's say your uh, the user is in India and uh, your server is just around the globe. Now, if you if you request something from uh, if this user requests something, the request has to travel around the globe to get the uh, HTML and then return back to user, which is why this uh, index of HTML can grow large. Uh, one more thing is, um, let's say you are uh, using React and you load multiple components, then uh, the render to string itself can take some time to uh, execute and create the HTML. Uh, this problem can be solved using CDNs. Um, CDNs are these um, edge locations that you have um, closer to user. So if, if my user is in India, it's, uh, the CDN is going to be pretty close to the user as well. What we can do is um, 
we can cache on CDN. What that means is the first request uh, goes to server, the server returns HTML, and then I just cache that HTML on CDN, and then the user can request the subsequent uh, request. Subsequent uh, subsequent request can go to CDN and just return from CDN without really traveling across the board. This comes with a trade-off that um, your site can't be fully dynamic or it can have some limitations in terms of how much dynamic you can uh, your site can be. But uh, like talking in terms of user experience of loading the first useful information, uh, it, it can reduce your first uh, HTML load if, if it is possible for your use case. So server set rendering and caching is uh, something that works really well. Um, one more thing I want to talk about is static set generation. Static set generation um, is similar as well, where a server will probably just be some bucket uh, where you can just put your static contents. And CDN can infinitely cache the static contents and just serve uh, all the requests will get served from CDN itself. Um, so it's, it's again similar. I didn't add slide for it because um, the overall uh, like water flow will be similar. So we were, what we know now is if we want to get the useful information on screen as fast as possible, um, our framework has to support um, server set rendering, static set generation, or rendering on edge. Rendering on edge is again something similar, where CDNs are basically edge locations. They can have some computational power, and if you can render your sites on edge itself without really going to CDN, again comes with certain trade-offs. Um, we won't really go too much into details of rendering patterns either. But uh, yeah, what we know is it has to support um, these three things. Let's call it HTML frameworks or HTML first frameworks. This is usually a term that is used um, when there are frameworks that are um, primarily generating HTML. For example, Astro is uh, one of them which generates HTML. It's a static set generator. It generates HTML, but again, lets you do a lot of interactive things on top of it. Um, quick dev is again something that is an HTML framework. We'll talk about it in uh, next slides. So yeah, what we need is an HTML framework. Next, um, just going back to the problem statement to make it easy for you to build better uh, user experience. The next point was how smooth the site feels. Um, so how smooth the site feels, kind of uh, like. Okay, yeah, there's a uh, animation warning. There's a lot of animations here, um, but smooth uh, smoothness basically depends on these two things: interaction speed and um, animations. Interaction speed uh, is, uh, for example, time between you clicking the button and modal popping up. So, um, time between you uh, performing some action and you getting some output on screen for that. Uh, plus animations. For example, even in this example. If I just show um, navbar without animations, it won't feel smooth. But if this navbar also takes too long to load, it won't feel smooth either. So we have to solve for this smoothness, um, which takes us to our next point, which is hydration. Um, so we'll talk about hydration in details. Uh, this is the point that I want to cover the most because uh, it's still a very open discussion, and we don't quite have a proper solution to it. But uh, yeah, we'll see what our proposed solutions are there for hydration problem. Um, I, I want to explain what hydration is through examples. So let's let's see the example first. I have this basic setup here. Um, what it does is it's just a render function and returns HTML, and um, it prints that HTML on the screen. This is a server set rendered application. You can see there's a server.js. I'll just show. So we don't have to go through this code properly. But what it is doing is it is taking the rent output of render and it is setting that HTML um, as a response. It's an express server. So yeah, I can change something and it will change there. Uh, let's let's try this out in React. So first I'll set up server set rendering in React. I already have React installed here. So I'll just do import React and import React on server. Um, some of the CPAs have changed with React meeting. So yeah. And uh, I also have this counter example here, which is just a simple counter. It's 
count uh, set count and it, on button click it uh, just does the count plus. So I'll import this counter uh, component as well. And what I'm going to do is uh, call React on server, render to string. And um, yeah, we have uh, this counter here. Um, what render to string does is it takes the React component and it gives you an HTML output. So it it basically returns this this particular HTML. So this 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 works fine, but the problem here is we have counter right. It has to increase on button click. We have written code for that, but if you see, uh, it doesn't work because this is a static HTML. We are not doing anything to add event listeners to this button to um, plus plus this counter. Um, making, so basically, we haven't made this interactive yet. Um, hydration is the process of uh, making this interactive. So in React, what we do is, let's say if I render something inside this um, div ID app, I can just hydrate over the same app with the same counter example. And it just makes it work. So we have uh, we have interactive uh, in, we have added interactivity here. Uh, if I also go and see the source code of this page, you can see this hello count plus is actually in the DOM in the first response itself. So it didn't really add the empty app that you would usually get with client side rendering because it's uh, server side render. So this was already in the HTML. Um, all right, we have we have added interactivity here, so you can see there's a hydrate root um, method in the add DOM client, which we can call and uh, make things interactive. So that's hydration; it's just adding interactivity to your um, application. Um, one more example I have is resipe.com. If I go to resipe.com, this is also server side rendered. Um, application with um, hydration. What I can do is there is a runtime bundle to readable.com. I can just go and block this runtime bundle request. This essentially means I'm blocking the entire React. So the React is not going to load in readable.com now. Now, if you see, the site still loads. Uh, the entire site loads. Uh, in fact, a lot of CTAs are um, usable. For example, I can just click sign up and even the sign up opens. So the overall site is loading. It's just that it is not interactive. For example, if I hover over this nav bar, it's not really giving me, it's not opening the navigation bar because it's based on React and it needs hydration to open. So yeah, that's that's basically hydration. We'll talk about more examples in the next slides. Um, yeah. Anyway, so the next point is SSR with the um, hydration, server side rendering with hydration. Uh, what we saw here, what is happening here, for example, is um, first we are returning the HTML. So we get the initial load without being dependent on JavaScript. But then the interactivity is something that still depends on JavaScript. So if you see here the index of HTML loaded, the website showed the useful information then the JavaScript um, loaded, then the home page loaded, and then we, uh, then the site became interactive. Um, this can again become a problem if we have large bundles uh, and more JavaScript, because the longer, the, the larger code base you have, the longer it is going to take to make things interactive. Um, one more thing, one more gotcha about uh, hydration is uh, we can only hydrate everything in one go. So, the, the entire DOM has to hydrate at once um, in usual React setup. So we can just render to string um, this app once, and then we can hydrate over the entire app. But um, that basically means if I have footer.js, which isn't really important, um, but I still have to wait for that JavaScript uh, until the site becomes interactive. This is a problem. 
So the solution to that is, I'm not sure why this is not working. The solution to that is partial hydration. Um, partial hydration is a coin, uh, is a term coined by Jason. Um, there's an article linked to this slide. I'll, I'll share the slides later. But what it basically means is you can hydrate the pee, uh, chunk, the pieces on your site chunk by chunk. For example, I can hydrate uh, in jzp.com, for example. Let me just read this. Uh, the navigation bar is the important part that needs hydration. The rest of the part is pretty much static content that can load without hydration. So what with partial hydration, I can just load the navigation bar JavaScript and um, hydrate that JavaScript itself. So the uh, my navbar becomes interactive just after loading the navbar.js. And I don't have to wait for the rest of the application to add less of JavaScript to load to become interactive. Um, this basically means if my footer, um, my footer is something that is going to come at the lower fold. So it's not going to be that important to me. Um, so it doesn't matter to me if I don't load my footer, if I don't hydrate my footer in the first row, it is still going to be visible because it's server side rendered, but it, I don't have to make it interactive in the first fold. So I can just delay the rest of the JavaScript and focus on what is the topmost priority that I have um, and just load that first. And then I can just uh, hydrate rest of the things uh, later. In terms of code, what that essentially means is here, I just have app, right? I can just have different things like maybe navbar. And um, it can just be a similar call to this. And it can be some navbar component. So now I still have to follow the hydration rules where um, my content from the render to string has to match the content from hydrate root. But um, I can just um, have different roots in itself, uh, which hydrate separately. So yeah, that's that's partial hydration. That's one of the solutions that we have to um, the hydration problem. Um, next up, we have React server components. These are not on production yet, but uh, just something that uh, React is planning to add in future. And they have released one video uh, about it. Um, just talking about how it's going to work. What uh, they're going to add is um, they'll have footer dot, they'll have this um, convention where you can add dot server dot js or dot client dot js um, next to files, and that decides how the component is going to behave or where the component is going to run. For example, if I just say footer dot server dot jsx, that means my footer is only going to run on server and it won't have any JavaScript bundle. What it is also means is footer won't be interact. It won't have uh, much of the interactive things. So it will be like a, a static content. So if your footer doesn't need hydration, then the JavaScript itself won't go into the uh, production code. Or you can have navbar.js, for example. Navbar.js would be something that you probably have to run on server and client board. So you can just um, render on server and hide it on client the way you do it right now. Or you can have tooltip.client.jsx, which uh, only shows up on client and not on server. So this is one of the solutions. What we will do is think of this example. There's a lot of JavaScript here, main.js, homepage.js, navbar.js, footer.js. And the problem with current um, hydration bundles is um, it's if I have a footer that is not interactive, that is not really doing anything apart from uh, giving a static content, my um, JSX or my create element calls uh, are still going to land, land up on bundle. So this footer.js is still going to exist. But with footer.server.js, something like footer.server.js, we can just mark footer as only HTML or only server. And it will just end up being part of the initial HTML and it won't have any script that um, it won't have any bundle that uh, you need for hydration. So it will essentially decrease the bundle size and um, bring the hydration closer. <laughs> so that's uh, another solution. Uh, one more solution is resumeability. Uh, now, so what we talked about uh, here, everything we talked about uh, is kind of a problem with hydration because um, what we have to do is first we serve uh, HTML with render to string and um, the next hydration, for example, in this example, 
um, the the counter. For example, I'm here using counter here. I have to use the same counter function here and um, render it, uh, hydrate it over the same component uh, in order for React to work. If I don't follow this, um, the hydration just breaks, and um, we don't. The hydration doesn't work. That's uh, a rule of React hydration. But um, what quick, uh, what quick is trying to solve is uh, what they're saying is uh, the essentially we need uh, the first client render and server render to be same because it allows frameworks to add event listeners to them. What quick tells you is um, you can just have your HTML, just plain HTML without um, just uh, render it straight up, and um, then you can have JavaScript. Uh, which uh, the script that is added uh, in the HTML itself that tells you what is the app state. So it tells you that these are the things that are already rendered on server and don't really need any hydration and client because they are completely static. So Quick just takes that uh, information and uses that information to um, hydrate further or um, add interactivity further without really the kind of hydration that React adds. So it's um. It's sort of more like uh, resume. You're rendering on server, and then you're picking that state of server, and then you're resuming from that exact state uh, on client. So you don't really end up um, bundling something like footer JS um, twice if you don't need the hydration for it. Um, this will essentially mean that your um, everything is HTML by default, and um, you choose what is JavaScript. So. For example, I can just have navbar.js, which is the only interactive part, and only that is the part that uh, I need to load for in order to make the navbar interactive. So these are the three solutions we have. Um, there is one more solution. It's not a solution, but it's sort of a hack that we did on reusefy.com. It's 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 a magic. I won't recommend uh, people to follow this, but uh, yeah, let's. I, I just wanted to show it. It's really cool. Um, what I'm going to do is again go back to network call. I'll go block this runtime bundle. So it's blocked now. Um, like I show, uh, like I said, um, the React is blocked now. So the site is not supposed to be interactive. Um, it it should only work with this anchor tags. But here's a, here's a magic. If I click this navigation bar, it actually works. Uh, that's because we do this one uh, weird hacky thing on laserpay.com where uh, what we do is we just add uh, an inline JavaScript that adds class name. And then depending on that class name, um, we just uh, display the navbar. It still doesn't work. Uh, the rest of the parts still don't work because uh, it has to wait for hydration and the navbar is a pretty complicated PCS, so we need React to handle the state management for this. But um, it essentially solves the problem that the navbar, the first um, opening of the navbar is independent of React and can happen before React. I think I might be able to show it. I don't remember what it is called. Uh, yep, this particular script. So it is injected on server side uh, when we return the server HTML. And that just helps us hydrate. Uh, it's it's basically just adding the class name nav open. And depending on the nav open, I can just do CSS animations to open the navbar and close the navbar. Um, if I close this, so yep, after the hydration, the entire thing still continues and works. So it's a hacky solution. I won't really recommend this to anyone, but it's just something we had to do because um, uh, we don't have any other solution yet, and the navbar is the only thing that is uh, intera that we have to make interactive. Um, just a summary: um, we talked about user experience mostly. Um, this was the major part. We talked about to load useful information fast and the rendering patterns, and to make site interactive fast, it's more related to hydration. Um, going back to this problem statement, to make it easy, uh, this is the problem statement that we initially um, talked about, to make it easy for you to build a better user experience. There is this to make it easy part. Um, everything we talked about in this 
all of that can be done without using front end framework as well i can just uh, use the vanilla html css and um, build a really fast interactive website i can even just um use a plain express js server that returns string and um does the server side rendering but um what frameworks essentially do is everything that i talked about it, the frameworks are supposed to make it easy for you to do these things um which takes us to uh, one tiny topic for developer experience uh, it's it's very very important it's sort of a direct goal of frameworks so it's more like frameworks improve developer experience so that developers can improve user experience so this is something that i want to talk about but i'm i won't go too much into details of this because this too many subjective things when it comes to developer experience syntax for example uh, one of them is a swell counter one another is a react counter uh, i love both of them um, but yeah you can have a choice you can say that you like swell counter more than react counter or you can say that react counter more than swell counter or counter may be a really small example um, in general uh, talking about the larger websites um, you can have different uh, opinions about different syntaxes you can also have different opinions about directory structures for example one of them is an angular directory structure and the other is a view directory structure uh, angular was my first framework that i worked on when i started with development uh, and i really uh, like this directory structure more where i could just define .css and .html because i wasn't very comfortable with javascript so i could just completely ignore the javascript part and just do my html css things in there and uh, JavaScript could just be something that I got from boilerplate and just some very minimal code. <laughs> so I like this directory structure. Or um, Vue has a single file component where you can just have dot view component and it will have all the HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Or React has uh, a different directory structure. Again, it's something very subjective, uh, which I won't go into detail and I won't really necessarily make any choice here. It's up to you which one you like. Um, but there are non subjective things. For example, core principles. Um, Remix, uh, for example, uh, has a core principle that they focus on their standards. Um, take this form uh, from Remix. Form method post. This is just this just looks like an HTML form, but it's not. It um, it gives you a better user experience and just um, overall better control. And they they have kept the API very similar to HTML. And I think that's a really cool core principle to have in a framework. A tiny plug, uh, I built the static site generator that I'm working on is, uh, again, one example where uh, something that I'm very proud of, where I try to stay close to HTML. For example, in Abel, you can just have two files, index.abel, about.abel, which look very similar to HTML uh, with some tiny differences. And I can just go and run npx abel serve, and this just works. You don't really need uh, much of a setup. These are non-subjective things. Another is uh, API decisions. It can be subjective and non-subjective as well. Non, uh, I put it in non-subjective because these are really good inspirations to have. So let's talk about partial hydration in Astro. Um, Astro supports this client directives where I can just say client load, which um, by default partially hydrates by button and it loads it uh, in the first go. It also has client idle, which means uh, it, it's, it's still partially hydrated, but um, it can delay its um, loading it can it, it it uses request idle callback to load that component so it can load it later when uh, main thread is free um, another api decision that i really like is server only components in sweltkit um, in sweltkit you can just define export cons hydrate false and that makes the hydrate that disables the hydration that makes um, swelt components um, just server only it also has router faults, which also removes the JavaScript that is needed for client-side routing. And it just turns back to the default routing behavior. So if I do both of this, uh, my component uh, bundles zero JavaScript and circuit. So I think this is a really cool uh, API decision to have. Another is intuitiveness. Um, this is, uh, again, I'm going back to a bit of subjective, but uh, I feel it's it's a really cool inspiration again. Um, in Svelte, this is a uh, this is a counter in solid. In solid, um, if I log console log high in a component, it just only runs once. And I think this I, I really feel this uh, 
is more uh, understandable behavior to me, a, a more expected behavior to me. If someone had not introduced me to React, and if this is the code I had seen first, I would have said that this is this works exactly the way I expect it to work. So I think this is a really cool uh, thing in Solid. Um, Aditya is going to talk about Solid uh, after me. Um, so yeah, I think he'll cover more in details. But yeah, in Twitter news. Um, conclusion, we, the, essentially the talk was about front-end frameworks and what is the ideal React or um, what is the ideal framework. Uh, I'm just going to drop it depends form. It, it, depends, um, the, it depends on the use case. It depends on what you're building. For example, even I talked about SSR or SSR with CDN caching, um, they come with their own challenges. SSGs come with their own limitations. You can't do much dynamic things. So a lot of it kind of uh, lands up on what you're building. Um, what I definitely feel that is going to happen is uh, we'll always have multiple frameworks and um, there will be multiple uh, use cases for them. So one, you, for one, uh, one framework would be better for one use case and the other would be better for the other use case. Um, but I definitely have some opinions uh, about uh, what is nice trade-off. Um, this is a lot of things. Like, um, for example, this is something that I would really like to see ecosystem of the art with the intuitiveness of solid, um, the abstractions of Sweld, and the HTML first output like Quick or Astro, where um, they don't really uh, add JavaScript by default, and the core principles of Remix, where they try to stay closer to web fundamentals or um, just the overall API design of Remix. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, other things as well that I like from other frameworks, um, but yeah, these are the, like, the top ones that I could think of. Um, and finally, to conclude, um, new frameworks come with new ideas. Um, and I think what is more important than new frameworks is these new ideas. Um, they compete with each other and make each other better. So even the, the entire hydration talk has been improving the overall hydration solutions that we have. Um, and it's really nice to see um, more and more frameworks coming up. Uh, it's it's a controversial thing to say, but I would really love to see more frameworks. Uh, I know we have a lot of them, but um, yeah, I would just love to see more and more ideas coming forward. Um, the purpose of this talk was to just uh, explain hydration rendering or um, the developer experience or the, what the ideation of front-end frameworks look like. Uh, so yeah, there is no ideal front-end framework as such. Um, these are just some of the uh, references that I took. Um, so yeah, you can go through them. I have, uh, I'll share my slides somewhere. So yeah, you can go through them. The, a lot of them were very useful for me. Um, that's it. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you can, if you have any questions, you can tweet them up to me on Saurabh Dowry on Twitter, or um, you can also check out my site project, abel.js. Um, didn't talk about this in details today, but yeah, I, I might be talking about it in the future. And yeah, so rubdowry.in has all the other links that you would need.